Our last session, we were looking at theological formation in the Arabian background with a particular focus on the Christian context and the dynamic interaction between the Christian communities and, um, and the emerging Muslim community. Uh, we now want to go to the second dimension of um, the Arabian context in which the Muslim Ummah community developed, namely the Jewish uh, context. Uh, particularly after the migration, the immigration from uh, Mecca to Medina in the year 622, um, the, in, the interaction between the Muslim community and the Jewish 622 was, was that migration called the Hijra. And after that migration, particularly the interaction between the Muslim community and the Jewish community became very intense. Um, and it was a, um, a double-sided uh, interaction. On the one hand, uh, a lot of admiration for what the Jews were about. Uh, on the other hand, enormous dismay, enormous dismay that the Jewish people as a whole did not accept Muhammad as a prophet of God. I think this was a great surprise to Muhammad. And, um, there's evidence of a lot of intense dialogue and discussion and confrontation about that. Uh, for example, the Jews would say, I'm imagining now that this is not recorded, but just uh, let me imagine uh, that the Jews would say, the prophets of God are descendants of Abraham. Um, and, and, and you're not a descendant of Abraham. Muhammad, re his rejoinder was, well, I'm a descendant of Ishmael the firstborn son of Abraham. So how can you say that I can't be a prophet of God? The blood of Abraham flows in my veins. Now, nothing specific in the Quran is recorded like that. But as we look at the growing tension and, um, and interaction between the Jewish community and the Muslim community and the dispute about whether Muhammad is a prophet of God or not, I think my imagination about all of this is not wild. I think it is an educated imagination, those kinds of discussions going on. Um, and um, um, the, 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 um, the embrace of various Jewish themes within the emerging Muslim Ummah is really very significant. Uh, like I mentioned earlier today, there is more in the Quran about Moses than any other prophet, Muhammad included, you see. Uh, great respect for, for Moses. Uh, Moses tried to do what Muhammad did. Moses tried to integrate the political and the religious order. And he did quite effectively for Israel. Muhammad emulated uh, that uh, commitment by Moses at, in Medina in also attempting to integrate the political and the religious order. And Muslims will feel, of course, that Muhammad did a better job than Moses for the political order that Muhammad put together in, Med in Medina was able to expand and to grow and become a worldwide movement, whereas what Moses did with Israel never moved beyond Israel. He only was able to put a political system in place that was effectuated for Israel, not a universal system like Muhammad did. But the idea of integrating the political military order came not only from the Constantinian reality that we talked about in our previous session, but also in, uh, in, in the model that Moses, that Moses demonstrated, which obviously Muhammad had a great admiration for. Um, the, um, the, the similarities between the Jewish and the Muslim movement are, are very significant. Uh, for example, um, we note here the name for God. Uh, Abraham worshiped God Almighty, whom he referred to as Elohim. Elohim, or just El, El or Elohim. The Arabic term for this Hebrew Elohim is Allah. So the name for God that the Muslims embraced came from Abraham, you see. The Semitic way of saying God Almighty was Elohim. The Arabic transliteration is Allah, you see. So Allah and Elohim are really synonyms. So even the name for God 
that the Muslims embraced comes to them through the Abrahamic stream within Judaism. Um, and uh, of course, Islam insists in that is the right name for God. <laughs> Don't be inventing other names for God. This is the right name for God, Allah, which comes to us from Elohim. That's very significant. And certainly Muhammad saw his mission as being to proclaim the God of Abraham uh, and no other God. Uh, that, that, that was what he was about, he believed. Scripture, within, within the Jewish movement, the Torah is at the center. The Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, um, of the Christian Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Torah, the law of God. That's at the very heart of Judaism. If you ever go to a Jewish synagogue, they always read the Torah. Every time they get together, it is right there at the heart of what they're all about. The whole community develops around the centrality of God's revelation of his law, the Torah, which is to be believed, to be believed and to be obeyed. As we said earlier today, for the Muslims, it's the Quran. You see, so Quran in Islam really takes the place of Torah in Judaism. But the, the, the theology uh, of embracing a central scripture uh, is similar for both movements. Within Judaism, Torah is, is the word of God, every letter. When the Jews read the Torah in the synagogue, you don't have just one person standing up and reading. You have the reader, and then you have the witnesses standing and watching every word to be sure that no mistakes are made, that there's absolutely no deviation from this inspired, literally re revealed word, you see. That's how they read the scriptures in the, in the synagogues. This morning I picked up my Bible, I read. There was no one looking over my shoulder to make sure I said every word exactly what was in the Bible. But for the Jews, when you read the Torah, every word must be exactly the same. Muslims have the same concern, that the Quran, every word came from God they believe. And you must have no deviation from that original revelation. That is their conviction. The Torah and Quran in their place within these communities of faith is very, very similar. For the Muslims, it's the Quran. For Jews, it's the Torah. As you know, as time went on, and we'll talk more about this later on, the, 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 the Muslims then developed another level of authority called Sharia. meaning the law. This is the application of how the law, how the Quran should be applied in everyday life, you see. We want to obey the Quran. how do we do that? The Sharia, the, the legal systems called the Sharia, they describe how you should live in order to follow the Quran. For the Jewish people, what do they have? The Talmud, exactly right, see? So for the Jews, you have this outer, they call it the fence around the Quran, around the Torah which describes how you should conduct yourself in order to obey the Torah. And the Talmud is voluminous. You know, it is volumes and volumes. You spend a lifetime studying the Quran, studying the Talmud, you see. The Jewish law, <laughs> it, is, it, it touches every area of life. I go to a synagogue occasionally in, in the United States, an Orthodox synagogue, and if we come into a room and it's dark, the rabbi will say, I can't turn on the light on the Sabbath. You turn on the light for me. Gets a Gentile to turn on the light. Because as he reads the Torah and the, and the Talmud, you're not allowed to light a fire on the Sabbath. And, and electricity is a fire. So you can't start this fire. You can't start a fire, you see. So let a Gentile start the fire. I will turn on the switch, you see. The Talmud, every area of life meticulously described how you shall function in order to obey the Torah accurately. Well, with Muslims, it's the Sharia. And the Sharia is volumes and volumes. In fact, the, much of the energy of the Islamic civilization worldwide for many centuries has gone mostly into the Sharia. Studying the Sharia, understanding the Sharia, and how we put every area of life under the authority of this Sharia, which is also called a fence around the Quran. As Muslims have the Talmud as a fence, as Jews have the Talmud as a fence around the Quran, so Muslims have the Sharia as a fence around the Quran. And of course, 
we'll talk more about this later on, I'm just going through this very quickly here, um, uh, in order to understand, in order for the Sharia to come into place, you need another layer, layer of authority uh, beyond the Quran, and this is called the Hadith. The Hadith, which is the traditions. And so the Sharia develops based upon the Hadith and the, the traditions and the Quran. The Hadith are descriptions of how Muhammad conducted his life and so forth, you see. So we have these two layers, the Quran at the heart, then the Hadith, which form the Sharia, you see. And within the, within the Jewish movement, you have the Torah and the Mishnah, you see. The Mishnah, which is the traditions of the, of the, of the, um, of the rabbis, you see. So this Mishnah goes into the formation of the Talmud. Very similar systems, you see. Uh, it, there's other areas of similarity as well. For example, Muslims go to a mosque to worship. Where do the Jews go for worship? The synagogue, you see. A place for worship. Um, and uh, <laughs> the Jews worship towards a location. What's that location? Jerusalem, exactly right. And the Muslims? towards the Kaaba in Mecca. Now, for a long time, the Muslims worshipped towards Jerusalem at the beginning of the movement, just like the Jews do, you see. And uh, the great divide took place in, in Medina, where it became clear that the Jews were not going to accept Muhammad as a prophet of God. And he was extremely disappointed in that. And it was at that time, then, that they decided to turn the direction of prayer away from Jerusalem towards Medina. And so it was now clear that the Muslim movement will go in directions other than Judaism. It's obvious, I believe, that Muhammad fully believed the Jews would welcome him as a prophet of God, and this Muslim movement would be an expression of Judaism, an Arab expression of Judaism. I think that's what he longed for, what he wanted to happen. Also, an expression of the Christian movement. Both, he hoped, could come out so I'll come together um, and converge within, within the Muslim movement. And he was keenly disappointed when Christians did not embrace Muhammad as a prophet of God, and extremely disappointed when the Jews rejected him and refused to accept that he was truly a prophet of God. And so then the direction of prayer turns now towards Mecca instead of towards, towards Jerusalem. So the Jewish influence is very significant in the formation, in, in, uh, is very significant in the development of the Muslim Ummah, as I see it. Uh, some, some scholars, and I wish Katareg were here to hear me say this, I always imagine as I'm giving lectures that my dear friend Baju Katareg is standing with me. I wish he were here to respond to what I'm going to say now. Um, and uh, he may agree, he may not agree. But um, um, it, it seems to me uh, it, it, and this is, as I say, the opinion of a number of scholars, that uh, the Jewish influence is so significant that, um, that uh, Islam is, is a kind of after-Christ form of Judaism. Um, remember, uh, Muhammad insisted that he is bringing nothing new, that the faith of Islam is in continuity with the other prophets. And so I think most Muslims would agree with what I'm saying, yeah. Our intention was that Islam be in continuity with Judaism. Uh, it's refining it, making it more perfect, more clear, but it stands in, in continuity with Judaism. And as I see it, that is really true, that Islam is, a very, is in many, many ways in continuity with Judaism. Um, that, that's, that's how I see it. 